This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four times elected president of the United States. The first re-election is the critical change from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the candidate of, from outside, from New York, in a Democratic Party dominated by the South and had been even before the catastrophe of the Civil War, and into a national party, 1936. I welcome David Petrusha, the historian and storyteller of the new book, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, subhead, FDR's 1936 landslide and the triumph of the liberal ideal, revelatory about trends that are in place today, voting demographics, national attention for where the Republicans do not fare, where the Democrats fare very well. David, a very good evening to you. Hearty congratulations. And we begin in 1936 as Louis Howe lays dying. And Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt's wife, very strong-minded wife, but alienated from his affections for many years, has attached herself to caring for Louis Howe in the hospital as he coughs himself into what we know now is the end, the end days, a, a, a smoker, a incessant smoker, and a man of very poor health habits. But the man credited for riding with Roosevelt from the early success as a New York State Senator campaigning in Dutchess County, all the way into the White House in the election of 32. It is now April 36, and Louis is dying. What does he represent to the president? What does he represent to Eleanor? Good evening to you, David. Good evening. Uh, Louis Howe is, of course, a mess at that point. And he's always been a mess, rather unsightly and in many cases unpleasant, acerbic. Uh, but he had always been, he had worshipped Franklin Roosevelt from the time he had met him in 1912 in Albany, helped him get reelected to a, basically to a Republican district in the state Senate and guided him uh, until 1932 when they make the big jump to the White House and when um, he works himself like 16 hour days and gets it to under 100 pounds. But his, his uh, smoking has caught up with him in 1934. He has severe bronchitis in 1935. They've moved an oxygen tent into his room in the White House, which is strewn not only with oxygen tents, but liquor bottles and with portrait upon portrait of Eleanor Roosevelt. So while uh, Louis Howe worships uh, Franklin Roosevelt and is an invaluable aid to him on political strategy, he also is very, very tight with Eleanor Roosevelt. And in 1920, when Franklin runs for the vice presidency, he starts pushing Eleanor into a greater political activism and bucking her up and moving her forward. And, you know, after Franklin Roosevelt's affair, which was uh, uncovered in 1917 uh, by Eleanor with Eleanor's former uh, social uh, secretary, she needs some bucking up in her life. And when he, Louis, becomes ill, uh, fatally ill, she moves in, uh, arranges for his doctor appointments, literally drives her, uh, him, in her limousine to Bethesda Hospital and will end up making arrangements for the funeral. Right. But the question at this point is, will Franklin have the political smarts enough to go on to this re-election campaign, which, you know, you might see a uh, sort of springing back to the Republicans without this great political mastermind behind him, Louis Howe. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal has been rejected by the court in 35 and two blows, one about the worst of all about the NRA. These are New Deal programs that were seen as necessary to revive a country that was extremely discouraged with the Great Depression or Great Recession, the devaluation of everybody called deflation and the forlornness of the agrarian America, where there was a, a great deal to do to revive a people who felt abandoned 
by the national government under Hoover, for whatever reason. We're not going to refight the 32 campaign. We're under 36. April 12th, 1936, Louis Howe is dead. Now Franklin Roosevelt faces new opponents without the advice of Howe. As David says, acerbic, my God, he was cynical beyond belief about politics. The first big obstacle that Franklin must face is his friend, Al Smith, 42nd governor of New York, the man who endorsed Franklin Roosevelt to become the governor of New York in 1928, a man who has uh, very much enjoyed the celebration of the Democratic Party, despite the fact that he's Roman Catholic, that he's wet, that means that he's against prohibition, and that he represents Tammany Halt in the eyes of everyone in the nation. Franklin Roosevelt is his protege. Why does Franklin fear, well, why is he anxious about Al Smith once Louis Howe's gone, David? Well, Al Smith is not just acting on behalf of Al Smith, he's acting on behalf of Al Smith's recent friends who are, shall we say, richer than Croesus. Uh, Al Smith, after losing the presidency race in 1928 to Herbert Hoover, is uh, needs a job, and he gets a job uh, from John Jacob Raskob, uh, who was the uh, chairman of the Democrat, National Democratic Committee. Um, and that job is to run the Empire State Building at $50,000 a year. Uh, not a bad uh, work if you can get it in the middle of a depression or managing a building which is seriously empty. It's called the Empty State Building, aside from the em Empire State Building. But even before the uh, 1932 campaign, uh, Smith is disaffected with Roosevelt. He had thought he was going to be, shall we say, the power behind the wheelchair when FDR is elected governor of New York. One of the things about FDR is people underestimate him. They think he's either physically incapable of, of doing the, the job as governor or president of the United States, or mentally. They just think he's some rich kid uh, who is a, a, a dilettante and, and not the political mastermind that we know him to be. But um, in 1932, Smith is going to challenge Roosevelt, and he beats him. He beats him in the latter primaries in, in the Northeast. He has a tremendous following among the Catholics of the nation, uh, even uh, after the advent of the New Deal. And he is worried. When Roosevelt uh, gives a speech in Minneapolis uh, talking about the forgotten man, uh, Smith says this is an affront. This is, this is class warfare. This is not what you should be doing uh, in, in America. So Smith has had these doubts all this time. And then when the New Deal gets up and rolling, Smith and his associates who are going to form something called the American Liberty League um, are going to come out with a whole bunch of, um, of position papers and, and speeches which are go out to um, uh, cast doubt on the constitutionality and viability of, of Franklin D. Roosevelt's program. And um, Franklin Roosevelt knows that on his right frank flank of the Democratic Party, you know, the parties are not uh, uniformly progressive or conservative. And there is still a uh, conservative wing in the Democratic Party, aside from what we normally think of being in, in the South. It's also in, in the Northeast. The Northeast was still a remarkably conservative area. Uh, it is the West and the South which had put Roosevelt in in 1932 and the Northeast which had resisted him. And it was the Northeast, uh, a band stretching from Northern New England uh, all the way through Pennsylvania, New York, upstate New York, Pennsylvania and Ohio, which still supported uh, Hoover. So all those factors mean that Franklin Roosevelt is nervous when Al Smith take, rises to the podium at the beginning of 1936 at the Mayflower Hotel to lambast uh, the New Deal and saying that the socialists had really stolen the, uh, or the New Dealers had stolen the socialist program. 
And that is an interesting um, situation for Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats because it gives them a target to shoot at. They, and you're going to see throughout this campaign, a campaign of class warfare being waged by Franklin Roosevelt and, and the Democrats. And where you take a shot at those rich guys, the guys in the silk cats, the guys who, whose capitalism was saved by Franklin Roosevelt are, are tremendous ingrates and wanna go back to imposing their will on the American people and basically exploiting them. Yes, at that dinner in January of 36 in Washington, afterwards, the WAGs say that Al Smith has traded in his brown derby for a top hat. I mentioned yes. that there were very wealthy people in the room led by the DuPonts, including E.F. Hutton. However, we need to turn from the right of Franklin Roosevelt to the, to the part of Franklin Roosevelt that is most in question in his mind, which is the solid South of the Democratic Party. The book is Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 landslide and the triumph of the liberty ideal. In April of 1936, there was no landslide. David Petrusha is the author. Roosevelt is without his best advisor. Louis, B. Howe is, Louis Howe is gone. Roosevelt now faces Al Smith, his old mentor on his right with the American Liberty League, preaching is the constitution for sale and other provocative remarks that irritate the president. He is very sensitive, although he's always laughing when you see him in the newsreels. That is a style that Louis Howe approved of, just keep them laughing. However, the president has to deal with the fact that he sits upon a Democratic Party that has been solid since the Civil War and before as what is politely known at the time as the way things are. We would call it today unacceptable racism, vast and crushing. The Jim Crow laws were the beginning of it. Roosevelt knows this. He also knows that he can be challenged from the South by two men, and we're about to meet them. One, his name is Huey Long from, from Louisiana, who is a character beyond belief, except for he, he's real. And the other is Herman Talmadge from Georgia. Let's start with Long, David. What is, Long is gone by 36, but what he represents challenges Roosevelt. What is What was it that was most worrying to the president that could be revived? Huey Long is represents really the greatest force of the populist left. I mean, he's not a, uh, people say, well, he was a fascist and all that. What does that mean, left or right? But his economics are pure left wing. And he presents a program in Louisiana, which is to fight standard oil, to tax standard oil, to pave the roads, to build bridges across the Mississippi, to give out sc free school books to the children in the public schools there. And nationwide, he forms a program which is called Share Our Wealth. And he's gonna seize all the, all the assets of people over a million dollars and the incomes over such and such amount and hand out just huge sums of money to every family in America and give them a car and a radio and whatever the hell they need uh, whenever they need it and even when they don't need it. And he is remarkably entertaining. Now you allude to what sort of a figure he was. And it's not just his program. It's not just the economics. It's, it's the presentation. And he makes uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, oratorical skills look like uh, Herbert Hoover. He is damn interesting. And with this program, when he goes on the radio to attack Roosevelt, and he had supported him reluctantly in 1932, you know, there are tens of millions of people listening. There are millions of people in the Share Our Wealth Club. But Huey Long, whose strategy is to become president, not in 1936, but in 1940, aims to run in 1936 after he gets a bunch of people who won't run in his stead and to siphon off enough votes in key states to elect the republicans and his theory is this that we'll elect the republicans again they will come in and they will make a worse hash of the country than herbert hoover had previously done 
And then the country, having rejected the Republicans and having rejected Franklin Roosevelt once, will turn to Huey Long as the man on the white horse and put him in the White House in 1940. However, there's one small problem with his plan, which is that in September 1935, he returns to the Louisiana State House to push everyone around and to create some uh, onerous laws uh, limiting the freedom of the local governments there. And he is shot uh, by somebody who was not crazy about him, obviously, and dies in September 1935, leaving that field clear or clearer for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, clear except for one other player who now enters at the scale of Huey Long, Herman Talmadge, who is uh, also a young man in a hurry uh, uh, with a, a country style that appeals to the rural parts of Georgia and rural parts of the South, uh, telling people that they only have three friends they can count on, God, Sears, Roebuck, and old Gene. Uh, Gene, uh, old Gene, uh, Gene Talmadge is a, the question here is what is it that they represent? You say populism, David, but at the same time, they come up with these preposterous schemes of give give money away, calling Roosevelt Franklin Lennon Roosevelt. So was communism the problem in the South in 1936? We know it is in the North where the Communist Party is active, but also in the South. Well, it's actually, uh, as you mentioned uh, later on, Gene Talmadge, Eugene Talmadge, Herman Talmadge was his son right? Uh, who in, in our memory, who we later become, became a United States Senator. Gene Talmadge is, is populist in his, in his rabble rousing, in his race baiting, in his accusations of communist influence in the New Deal. Uh, but he's, he's, he's sort of, he's very different than Huey Long in terms of his uh, ideological orientation. He's more of a Jeffersonian conservative and he refuses to fund welfare programs in the South. And even though a huge number of people in Georgia really need it and need a New Deal backing. But, um, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. So the folks who were supporting Huey Long in 1935 and his radical program to the left of Roosevelt suddenly swing into action in January 1936 and show up at a rally, uh, which Frank, uh, which uh, Eugene Talmadge is hosting in Macinger, Georgia. And this thing is like uh, these guys are about ready to fire on Fort Sumter again. About <laughs> they've, 30, they've, seconds, they've, 30 seconds. Go ahead. They have got the Confederate flags out there and they are just hooting and hollering and red baiting and really uh, race baiting as well. David Petrusha, Roosevelt sweeps the nation. FDR's 1936 landslide and the triumph of the idea. Two of the most important figures of the 1936 election who were not elected, but made very important contributions to how the president, Franklin Roosevelt, saw his campaign ahead. The first is Francis Everett Townsend, born 1867, a senior figure who is a physician, and he comes forward with the Townsend plan. This is in the time of great want and doubt for the people who are elderly in, in America. At that time, that was considered 60 years plus was elderly. David Francis Townsend, looks to be an amateur. And the fact that he enters into politics at all is so unlikely. What do we need to know about how Roosevelt thought of Townsend? Well, Townsend was this old geezer doctor who writes a letter to the uh, local paper saying, we've got to have this plan, which is uh, going to give $200 a month to uh, everyone over 60. And they will have to do two things for it. One, uh, not work anywhere, and to spend it all in 30 days. He thinks this is going to be create a velocity of money, which sort of like pri uh, priming the pump, getting the economy up and running. Um, he's a pretty dull fellow otherwise, but uh, millions and millions of people join these Townsend clubs in uh, around the country, 
and they start electing congressmen. Now, Franklin Roosevelt, well, first off, one thing about Franklin Roosevelt is for all his big spending, hates the dole. He hates the idea of people just sitting around and giving a government, getting a government check. This is one reason why we have so many uh, remnants, relics, uh, artifices of the New Deal still around today. He built all those post offices and dams. He wanted people to do things for them. And the Townsend plan is just a giveaway. And it's a giveaway based on a use tax, which is, uh, you know, 2% on every, every uh, transaction in creating a product or service. So you have a pencil and it may be 2% on the wood and 2% on the lead and 2% on the eraser and 2% to sharpen it. And this is going to cause an amazing uh, increases in the cost of goods. Franklin Roosevelt hates this plan, but he's not crazy about doing old age pensions until the Townsend plan threatens to sweep the nation. Harry Hopkins, his big uh, so uh, welfare advisor, gives a speech one day and says, oh, the next priority has to be old age pensions. And Franklin Roosevelt the next day says, no, it's not. But when the Townsend plan is introduced into the House of Representatives, the very next day, Franklin Roosevelt introduces Social Security. So this is the driver of Social Security. It really we... is. It's a Franklin Roosevelt is in many instances reactive to things. There are things he obviously wants to do, whether there's outside pressure or not, like the CCC or uh, the TVA. These are these are things he's always cared about. But other things, maybe he cares about them, but maybe he has to be pushed into them at a certain point in time. Now Townsend is an extremely convincing about his plan, but he will have associates who who successfully turned it into a money raising scheme across the nation and a publication that sells advertising to what you'd have to say are patent medicines. In other words, it becomes an operation we recognize as merchandising. It's However, Townsend will link with another dynamic figure of the period whom everyone probably has heard something about. His name is Coglin. He's a Roman Catholic priest born in Canada, Ontario, Charles Edward Coglin, called Father Coglin. And what is important here is that Francis Townsend has no presence on the radio, the new technology of mass communication in, 19, in the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt is a star on the radio. He has a voice that is convincing and warm and intimate to enter into the homes of the nation. Father Coughlin has a similar, even more completely actor's voice. And he enters into this story first as a radio priest talking about Bible incidences or telling stories. And then he converts to politics. David, what made Coughlin move from talking about the Bible to talking about the New Deal? Well, there's uh, at first he he starts moving into politics and going against her. He hates Herbert Hoover. He hates prohibition. He hates divorce. He hates birth control. And after 1930, when Franklin Roosevelt is reelected in a landslide as governor of New York, he sees Franklin Roosevelt as the alternative to everything he's opposed to. And he thinks that he can influence Franklin Roosevelt uh, on largely monetary policy. He's very interested in, in that inflationary policy. They meet during the election of 1932, but like so many other people, like Al Smith, like Huey Long, like uh, Raskob with the Democratic National Convention Committee, uh, these people are going to eventually turn on Franklin Roosevelt. And so by 1935, 1936, you're going to find that, that Coughlin is no longer on the Roosevelt train and is looking, in fact, to challenge him. And he's going to turn, he's going to team up with Father Coughlin. He's going to team up with the remnants or uh, the singular remnant of the Huey Long movement, 
a fellow named Gerald, the Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, who uh, was maybe the equal of Huey Long on the stump. He's going to bring Townsend and Coughlin together to form that third party that uh, Huey Long was looking to form. So the reason Coughlin turns on Roosevelt is because Roosevelt stopped uh, stopped conferring with him and Coughlin felt he, he had been brushed off. He had so been I, used. That's what right. he and initially he's for him and then he's against him. And he links up with, with Townsend, the Townsend plan and Reverend L.K. Smith, who must have completely been an over-the-top figure to outdo uh, Huey Long. And what's important here is how Coughlin and Roosevelt deal with each other. Roosevelt calls him the Padre. And now we go to a scene that's impossible to believe, but David presents it. So I've, I've read it twice now and everything about it is magical. It is September, 1936. Roosevelt is on is on the way to the campaign. In other words, he took the summer off uh, relaxing and he's now thinking about how to build the campaign. He's at Hyde Park and in order to visit him that day, he's made arrangements for Father Coughlin to come and sit with him and talk about their differences and how they can work together in the campaign. Coughlin is reluctant at first, gives an excuse why he can't travel from Detroit to New York. But Roosevelt insists, and so Coughlin shows up at Albany Station, at, in Union Station in Albany, and he's picked up by a man in a Rolls Royce. Who is it, David? Why, that's Joseph Patrick Kennedy, who in fact had arranged the phone call for FDR to call the Padre and, and get him uh, on the road or on the railroad to uh, Hyde Park. And the timing... And the coincidences of this meeting are crazy. There is, David, it's really hard to believe that it happened. Let me let me introduce you to tell the whole story. They get in, uh, Coughlin gets in Joe Kennedy's Rolls Royce. They drive the hour or so to Hyde Park on the Hudson River, a beautiful setting. And I recommend everybody visit Hyde Park because you can understand the, the staging of what is about to happen. They come to the front door. Roosevelt's asleep because he sleeps in late. So they make themselves breakfast. And then they hear the president stirring upstairs coming down. At that moment, Coughlin approaches the president. Please, David, take it away. It's really hard to believe that it happened. Well, it is. And it's harder to believe that this is the morning after Huey Long was shot to death in Baton Rouge. It's also hard to believe that some accounts, or at least one account, says that Eleanor Roosevelt was on the same train as Father Coughlin. And uh, where she went that morning, I don't know, but she was often had her own agenda. And so uh, in the Rolls Royce, Joe Kennedy uh, drops the Padre off at the mansion. And then um, FDR says, uh, well, Joe, uh, why don't you go look at the pigs while I go talk with Father Coughlin and confer on things? So he just brushes off this uh, multimillionaire to get lost for, for the uh, day. And they are there for, it looks like, Coughlin says for six hours talking. Now, we don't know exactly what they said, but it didn't seem to go well because FDR, the president of the United States of America, asked Father Coughlin to stay for dinner. And, and Father Coughlin says, no, nah, I got another appointment. I'm seeing a friend in the Berkshires. I got to go. And that's about the last meeting they had. And after that, it's, as they say, war. Uh, we're, we're talking about a moment in time so, uh, the war between them, September 35, to the campaign in, 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 in 1936, Father Coughlin remains an extremely vital figure in that time, though he's on the outs with the president. Is that correct, David? It is correct, because he has a radio network. Originally, he was on, on CBS. They bounce him during the Hoover administration, but he forms his own network. He's like Mr. Syndicated Radio back then. And uh, and he people listen to him and trust him. And and he comes into like Franklin Roosevelt, he comes into their homes 
every Sunday night. Now, Franklin Roosevelt does not do this uh, to the extent that, that Coughlin does. From, from April 1935 to September 1936, there are no fireside chats. It's hard to believe that. But Coughlin is the bigger radio presence. And Coughlin now back to teaming up with Townsend, with Smith, and with a congressman named Lemke from, I believe, Nebraska is my memory. North Dakota. North Dakota, thank you. What is it that they want to achieve? How do they think of their campaign? They, they are following the tried and true, but the tried but never true uh, strategy of messing up uh, the major party candidates and forcing the election into the House of Representatives. And, but these guys are amateurs. I mean, even Lemke, what? He's a two-term congressman from North Dakota. Townsend and Gerald L.K. Smith and Coughlin had never been involved in electoral politics before. And Franklin Roosevelt, he's the pro. He thinks of this stuff 24 seven and they can't even get on the ballot in the big states. They can't get on the ballot in New York or Illinois or California. California is Townsend country. They're not on the ballot. So they're going to end up with only 1.2% of the vote. And also they have a problem that, you know, I, I've met Bill Lemke and he's no Huey Long. Right. Well, actually I never met him, but. <laughs> We're looking at what Franklin Roosevelt is thinking about are the challenges he must overcome without Louis Howe in the summer of 1936 into the campaign season. There are, are, are people who are gonna be on the ballot, however, that also worry him. And we're going now to both the Socialist Parties and the Communist Party, vital in the 1930s because of the scale of the economic tragedy. David Petrusha is the author of the new book, Roosevelt Sweeps the Nation, Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide and the Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. The Communist Party of the United States of America, the Socialist Party, they have figures that lead them. And they're important figures because of their connection to previous successes. The socialists had been successful since uh, all that century, since the earliest vote, 1912, I believe. Uh, David, help me. Was 1912 their top or was 1920 their top? I can't recall. But 1920 is when they top about 900. Well, it depends how you measure it. Yeah. 1920, they get the highest number of raw votes. 1912, they get the highest percentage. And even as late as 1932, Norman Thomas, who was their perennial candidate at this point, uh, following their previous perennial candidate, Eugene V. Debs, is still drawing 845,000 votes and drawing hundreds of thousands of votes in, the, in a recent uh, New York City mayoral election. So the socialists represent theory and book learning and classicism, but they also appeal to what we would say is the proto-union faction in the large city of New York. Roosevelt regards them as a challenge because they can pick off pieces of New York State, uh, pieces of the electorate in New York City in particular, and might cost him those electoral votes. The communist part of the USA is harder to imagine being a threat today, but at the time, it was led by a man named Earl Browder. And importantly, David, you've come up with a fact as to why Browder was still the head of the party. Uh, he was Stalin's choice. Why? Two reasons, actually. One, he wasn't Jewish. Stalin did not want a Jew representing the uh, American Commu Communist, Communist Party USA. And he was pliant. pliant. Uh, you didn't want some guy who was going to give you any trouble and Browder, who was sort of colorless and known as the bookkeeper, because he had been a bookkeeper, was a guy that Stalin could push around. Although um, Browder pushes back a little because Stalin, uh, who had originally been, oh, the Communist Party USA, at the beginning of the New Deal, was like, oh, this is some sort of fascist warmongering thing. Franklin Roosevelt is the tool of Wall Street, blah, 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 blah. And then when Stalin and the Comintern switch gears to the popular front uh, worldwide, 
to combat Hitler, uh, all of a sudden they say, well, maybe we should be supporting this Franklin Roosevelt, this guy. He could come in useful. Let's endorse him. And Browder says, no, 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 no. We would be the kiss of death to Franklin Roosevelt in the United States of America. So let's let's run somebody for president still and pretend we're running against him, but we will uh, fire all our opposition and firepower against Roosevelt's opponent, whoever that will turn out to be. So the communists are also a concern because they can pick off a splinter of the vote. This is a concern to Roosevelt as he's thinking about the And campaign. again, in New York City and California. And those two elements are sizable in his campaigning. How does he think um, uh, the communists endorse him? I think at one point they, they say the communism is, uh, stands right there with the red, white, and blue. 20th Not century Americanism. And uh, endorse Roosevelt, but this is the tricky part. The They do not speak for Roosevelt. They speak as if they're campaigning on their own, but they want Roosevelt elected. Why is that, David? Well, because they they, they do, it's this popular front and they are creating all these, these front groups at this point and getting a lot of just plain folks, middle-class people, uh, intellectuals to, to back them. Um, they are, um, again, uh, concerned about having Franklin Roosevelt in their corner when push comes to shove uh, against Adolf Hitler. They, again, they misjudged Hitler. They thought that with him coming to power, this would just accelerate the revolution in Germany. Well, hello, that never happened. And then in 1936, what happens is really the precursor to the Second World War, with civil war in Spain. So things are heating up internationally and they want to keep Franklin Roosevelt in their corner and in power. Uh, at the same time, the Communist Party of the USA is linked to, and we can mention the Farmers Workers Party. Do I have that right of Minnesota? This is uh, Olson. Farmer uh, Labor, I think. Yeah. Farmer Labor Party, which is a violent organization. This, uh, is, this is a crazy guy that no one remembers. Uh, people, somebody was asking me, did Huey Long ever have anyone killed? And it's like, I don't think so. But, but Floyd Olson, the governor of radical, a governor of, of um, Minnesota, who like Long wants to be president in 1940, but is playing footsie with FDR, uh, his allies, there, there are two newspaper people who are rubbed out in uh, gangland style, like right after one another, bang, bang, literally bang, bang. Uh, so th these are wild times. And, and this also speaks to the uh, radical agrarianism of the upper Midwest, where you have um, Olson in Minnesota, La Follette in Wisconsin, the La Follette's in Minnesota, uh, Lemke in North Dakota, George Norris in Nebraska. It's a different time and a different political geography. And Errol Browder does not push them away. He uh, is united front with a man who has his newspaper critics murdered or the, pre the presumption is they're murdered. Now, these are all the, the characters that FDR is thinking about as he prepares for the campaign. And when we come back, a gigantic figure, William Randolph Hearst in the campaign of 36, David Petrosha the author of F Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide and the Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. From the point of view of Ro Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there are figures on his left, there are figures on his right, there are figures who represent the Communist Party, there are figures who represent outright celebration of the dictators in Europe at this time, Mussolini and Hitler. But there is one figure that represents all of the above or none of the above, depending on the day of the week. William Randolph Hearst, born 1863. He is 72 years old, 73 years old at this point. And yet he can pick up the phone and reach anybody in America, including the president of the United States. David, it is a complication to summarize Hearst with Roosevelt in particular, 
He was for him before he was against him, before he was for him, before he was against him. Let's keep ourselves right now to 32 to 36. What was Hearst's opinion of Roosevelt in the campaign of 32 facing Herbert Hoover? Didn't like him. Didn't like Hoover. Didn't like Al Smith. Didn't like anyone except John Nance Gardner. And the Roosevelt has a problem in 1932. And that you know, has a bunch of problems, but um, the two thirds rule. So he can get to the, the convention and have oh the majority of the delegates, but he can't get the nomination until that log jam is broken and he gets two thirds of the delegates. But Hearst, who had uh, supported Garner, is uh, controlling California and Texas delegations. And even when FDR switches on the League of Nations to curry favor with Hearst, Hearst still doesn't like him. But Joe Kennedy goes to Hearst, uh, some other people go to Hearst and say, if you don't get, if you don't take Roosevelt, you're going to get somebody you like even less. And Hearst caves in and gets, you know, pretty good bargain. He gets to name the president and the vice president of the United States, but the deal doesn't take. And as Roosevelt moves more to the left uh, during the New Deal, and particularly with the National Recovery Act and talking about raising taxes on the wealthy, like William Randolph Hearst, Hearst becomes more and more disaffected. And Roosevelt has to make nice with him. And it's a very long, bumpy, involved breakup, but the breakup will come. In 1935, William Randolph Hearst personally owns 28 newspapers, eight radio stations, and David reports $100 million a year, which is more than every other nation except for four or five on, in the planet, in the solar system. This is all his power. And all politicians are aware of his positions because he writes, does he write in capital letters on the front page, David? Quite, or, a, quite uh, often it's in all caps and exclamation points and the little boxes on the front page, you know, even when he's not influencing the uh, uh, repertorial policy, uh, those editorials go on that front page. And actually, they're they're pretty well written. Uh, Hearst is so powerful that in 1934, he is invited by one of Hitler's go-betweens, Hampstegel, to visit Berlin and to visit with the dictator. Hearst and his colleagues and Marion Davies, his beloved. Uh, you all know Hearst from the Orson Welles movie. Uh, however, this is the genuine historical figure. We shouldn't confuse them. And Hearst was not shy about his relationship with Marion Davies. He, Hearst was many years older. And at the time, it was tist tist in polite circles, but it was acceptable in political circles and especially in Europe. And Marion Davies very much wanted to meet the dictator. She was disappointed and, in fact, tricked by Hearst and his colleagues. And Hearst had a meeting with Hitler in his office at the Reich Chancellery by himself. Again, David, this is one of those scenes it's hard to imagine and it's real. Do we know any, any amount? about how long the meeting took. You have some ideas about, but the, the sources here are incomplete. Uh, they're at variance with each other, where, where supposedly Hearst had told Marion that uh, it was always oh, like five minutes or 10 minutes. And with, you know, with all translations, you'd barely be able to say Gesundheit. Um, but the, uh, there's a fellow who accompanies uh, um, Hearst to the meeting, and, and he says it goes on for much longer Hearst has some letters uh, back and forth with, with, with his uh, editorial staff, and they're all giving different versions of this. But it appears that uh, Hearst kind of starts off with some flattery because flattery will get you somewhere, and but eventually does raise some sensitive issues like the persecution of the Jews. And, and he had talked uh, to Louis B. Mayer, a close friend of his, uh, beforehand as to whether this meeting would be a good idea and whether he should he should raise those issues. But when you're William Randolph Hearst and you're not too popular in a lot of circles anyway, uh, shall we say the visuals, even though there aren't literal visuals of this meeting, are not good for Hearst. And it really accelerates 
his decline in population, popularity and circulation of newspapers and advertising revenue. As we approach the campaign of 36, uh, the campaign season of 36, Ro uh, uh, the President Roosevelt is aware that he needs to make peace or in some fashion neutralize Hearst, who can swing tw all these newspapers against him. And there's a meeting at the White House with a go-between go named Koblenz. And I'm struck by what the president is thinking in the quotes that you provide, David. What worries the president at this time is what he calls crackpot ideas, longism, Coglinism, Townsendism. We've talked about those three. Although Huey Long is dead, that popular spirit is out there and Talmadge can use it, others can use it against the president. He doesn't say Hearst bothers him. Is Hearst looking to switch to the president at this time? Is the president hoping that Hearst will go his way in the campaign, this late in the campaign? Well, Koblenz being a Hearst man, he's not about to complain, complain to Hearst uh, uh, Koblenz about Hearst, and that will get back to him and just inflame the situation more. But this is at the time when Roosevelt is, as I said before, he would often react to these uh, measures outside pressures. And at this point, that's when Huey Long, uh, this is in response to Long's Soak the Rich program, and Roosevelt has his own Soak the Rich program at this point, tax program which is really going to inflame Hearst. And uh, Hearst, uh, uh, Roosevelt is talking about how he has to combat all these things, including communism. And he says with, and he gets stuck. He's not quite sure what to say. And Ed Koblen says, neo-communism. And Roosevelt, again, just sort of laughs, but doesn't really have an answer for that. And the conversation does get back to Hearst, as right. it was intended to. And the, the break is going to come. Yes, the quote that I like from that you picked up on, David, whereas the president allows in this conversation with Koblenz, it may be necessary to throw 46 men who make a million dollars a year to the wolves. That would be Hearst and his gang. Uh, and his colleagues, the wealthiest men in America. And Hearst then, is this when Hearst gives the order to reduce his income to under a million dollars? Was it? Yeah, yeah, because he, he says throw, I, I can afford, I cannot afford to, to pay this amount of taxes. I cannot afford to have this amount of actual income. I want the corporation to, to pick up the slack at say San Simeon and all his other uh, housekeeping um, situations. And there are several housekeeping situations. All right. So Hearst now is not decided, but he's not for the opponent yet. We've got to choose the opponent. And when we come back, the Republican nominees from 1936. The book is Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, FDR's 1936 Landslide and the Triumph of the Liberal Ideal. David Petrusha is the author in 1936 to face the president running for re-election president weighed down by all these opponents. And we need a Republican opponent because that will be the major party. And the first Republican opponent in the president's mind is I want to run against Hoover. Does the Republican Party want to run Hoover, David? Well, you might not want to relitigate 1929 and 1932 again. So while there's a little bit of nostalgia for him, and he gives a whiz bang talk at the Republican National Convention. Uh, no, the answer is, is absolutely not. We don't want to go there again. And Hoover reluctantly backs away. I say reluctantly because he's making better speeches now. You note that he's not stuck the way he was in 28. Very, very hard, very difficult. Uh, and what you say, slow paced presentation. He's making much furrier remarks, but we need to go to the other choice, at least early in the year. William Bora, known as the Lion of Idaho. Another character that you can't make up, David. So much of this strikes me all these decades later as, as characters out of a novel, not out of history. What do we need to know about Bora? And did Roosevelt want to run against Bora? Bora was... Um a old line progressive, but the very definition of a maverick. He rarely supported a Republican candidate for, for president. 
Uh, and often when he didn't, he just sit, sit it out in terms of, of peak. He was also, aside from being the uh, lion of Idaho, he was the stallion of Boise <laughs> and got around, shall we say. Um, uh, and one of his conquests was Theodore Roosevelt's daughter, Alice Roosevelt Longworth. Notice the, notice the Longworth there, where not only was she uh, he married, but he, he she was married to the speaker of the uh, future speaker of the House of Representatives, Nick Longworth. So he was an interesting guy and a great orator and a progressive and an isolationist. And he meets a lot with Franklin Roosevelt early in this campaign season. And the old guard Republicans in Northeast are wondering if this guy is, is really just a shill for Franklin Roosevelt. He's going to run, uh, not get the nomination, and then spend the rest of the uh, campaign lambasting the Republicans. It's a good suspicion. Uh, Frank Knox, Colonel Frank Knox, a rough rider from the Teddy Roosevelt rough riding in Cuba. But these many years later, he's a very prominent newspaper man and Republican. He also is a man who's been created by Hearst, but is now independent of Hearst and spends a lot of time on horseback, as far as I can see, uh, campaigning. What does Knox represent to the Republican Party? Boy, that's a good question because he had been more progressive and um, then he gets very, very agitated about Franklin Roosevelt as the campaign goes on and makes wilder and wilder charges. So uh, he's again, one of these political amateurs. He'd been in, he'd never run for office before and he's not quite ready for prime time. It's interesting that Franklin Roosevelt during the war is gonna reach out and make him secretary of the, of the Navy as he makes, uh, Mr. Stimson, Secretary of War, a couple of old Republicans. As uh, Frank Knox will spend a lot of time traveling to the Pacific to meeting with Chester Nimitz. We're talking about moments in time here that they flash before you. Frank Knox is a very brave man. However, the Republicans also have Arthur Hendrick Vandenberg, a newspaper man from Michigan, uh, who has a great quote, if we make the old deal, the issue will lose. Uh, However, he is also known as someone who can strut sitting down. What does he represent for the party? This is a possible nominee. Basically mainstream Republicanism. You know, he's not too conservative. He's not too liberal. He's, he's, he's more conservative than, than probably the, the country and the party wants this year. He also has this great idea or pushes an old idea into fruition early on in the New Deal, which Franklin Roosevelt is going to claim credit for which is to insure bank deposits, the FDIC. And once this goes into effect, then, then the banking system is, is stabilized. Money pours back into the uh, uh, banks. They start investing money in the, in the uh, uh, businesses, industry, and the economy really picks up. So he has, uh, even though he may be not the most pleasant or a uh, humble guy in the world. He does have some accomplishments in the political system, but he's pretty much dark horse territory outside of Michigan. And finally, we turn. there are other uh, names mentioned in the early polling, the governor of Illinois, former governor of Illinois, Frank Loudon. And, uh, but we're going to concentrate now on the complete surprise. His name is Alf Landon. He is now at this point when they're entertaining him, the governor of Kansas. But other than that, David, I can't find any reason for the Republicans to go to him other than the fact that he was none of the above. And he they was, didn't much know him. He was a millionaire and he was not secretive so much as uh, as unremarkable is my reading of him. How did you read him? He's the most, he's the least interesting character in the book. I mean, you see how many interesting characters we have. He was known as, well, when you have so few Republican office holders left after the big blowouts of 1932 and 34, you have, you have a limited talent pool. He's known as the Kansas Coolidge, a nickname he hates because he is not a Coolidge Republican. He's not a conservative. He's a progressive Republican. 
but he has balanced the budget. He has cut government spending in Kansas. And Hearst takes a look at him. He's urged to look at him by another publisher named Paul Block. And they go out, they visit with him. And even though there are a lot of policy differences between Hearst and Landon, um, he just falls in love with him. And he orders people like Damon Runyon to write newspaper pieces on, on what a great guy Landon is. And when you have hundreds of thousands of column inches in the Hearst papers devoted to Landon and not too much to choose from, by the time the convention rolls around, it's pretty much Landon's to lose. And he's not going to lose it. Yes, the puzzle here is that Lennon's governor by accident is way I, the way I read your reporting, David. It's a fluky election in 1932. The, there's a Democrat incumbent in Kansas, and he's not too bad, uh, but there is a goat gland doctor, I think named Brinkley, yes. who is selling these things to get the juices flowing, so to speak. And often they, these things end up killing his patients, but he has a 50,000 or 500,000, this huge radio station out there uh, blanketing the uh, midsection of the country with his, with his wares and his ideas. And it's one of those really rare three-way races. I mean, you always get third parties and maybe they get 12% or 2% or, but it's like 34, 32, 31% in the finals. So it's a complete fluke that Landon is, is elected. The trick is to get reelected in 34. And he does that and reasonably easily, not a huge landslide, but by Republican standards in 34, he's, he's a rock star. And final 30 seconds, David, do they listen to him on the radio? Do they hear his voice? Is that part of their notes about him? 30 seconds. Uh, no, he's, pretty damn awful in an era of radio stars like Coughlin and Roosevelt and Huey Long. He just emphasizes everything and is just, you'd be better off with dead air. Yes, you notice how the technology is a subplot in the campaign of 36. When we come back, the facts of the matter. David Petrusha, the book is Roosevelt Sweeps Nation. I'm John Batchelor. It's campaign time. Alf Landon and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the nominees of the major parties. And we begin with the Landon campaign because there's not a great deal to say except for why there isn't a great deal to say. David, Landon does not attend the convention that nominates him. What happens afterwards to remember? Thank you. Well, he makes up for not being there by not being there, by going on vacation for two weeks at a ritzy dude ranch, essentially, in Cal in Colorado, and then not doing anything for another few weeks while his, his campaign staff goes out there, but he doesn't. But when he finally does go out there, he's more energetic. He's still a bad speaker, but he gives a series of speeches at the end of the campaign or towards the end on the tariffs, on agriculture, and most horribly on social security, already the third rail of American politics and proceeds to just lose chunk after chunk of electoral support. We should mention there are polling um, results from this summer of 1936 that are striking. I have from your reporting, David, in July of 1936, uh, the Gallup poll, George Gallup's poll, records 272 electoral votes for Landon, 259 for Roosevelt, giving Landon the presidency. However, a month later, late August, we have 274 for Roosevelt and 257 for Landon. So the momentum suddenly switches somewhere between July and August. Does the Republican Party react, David? The Republican Party continues to, to pour money and speakers and organization into the race, but absent a compelling candidate and actually absent a compelling message because Landon continues to be this sort of progressive Republican and he's promising just to be more efficient. He's not going to really 
tinker that much with the uh, with the New Deal, and he had supported it throughout the um, his earlier tenure as governor of Kansas. But so the message is, oh, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. Only we're going to do it better, and that is not as compelling as um, as, as a message as Franklin Roosevelt has, as it, which is. I've already done this. I've done all this for you, and I'm going to protect you from these bad rich guys. There is a moment, again, you can't make this stuff up, where the two candidates meet. They're crisscrossing the country. It's My note says September 3rd, FDR and, Al, and Alf Landon meet in Des Moines, and they're polite to each other. Do, does Roosevelt leave a memory of what he makes of him at that point? Well, uh, Rex Tugwell, the famed uh, brain truster, says uh, thought, he thought that uh, uh, Landon was an extremely nice person, and they are so pleasant to each other. The Senator Capper of Kansas says he half expected one of the candidates to withdraw and endorse the other. I'm not sure which would have done that, uh, but it is, it is a remarkably cordial uh, meeting, and the circumstances are because, talk about climate change, uh, there was a massive heat wave that summer, not the Dust Bowl, but a heat wave where the temperatures are over 100 in Kansas when, Ro when Landon gets the nomination, 120 in one place in North Dakota, and the girders are warping. The steel is warping in New York City from the heat. The important detail here I pick up from David's reporting is that radio was extremely new to America. Not everyone had a radio set. It was something to aspire to. And on the radio, presentations were making men, especially stars. And one of the stars we've already talked about, Father Coughlin, another star, Franklin Roosevelt. At the time, how was Landon's presentation on the radio regarded? Did they note it, David? Well, Father Coughlin actually critiques him to the chair of the Republican National Committee and says he's never heard anything this bad in his life, that the accents all come on at the wrong part of the sentences. And he advises the, the chairman, uh, John Hamilton, to uh, get him off the campaign trail and to have him make no more speeches and to tell the public, uh, well, uh, Hamilton says, I can't do that. And Coughlin says, yes, you can just say that he uh, broke a leg um, and just make up a story. Get this guy out of the camp, off the campaign trail. Walter Lippmann is not kind to anyone because that was his job. He wrote of Landon, dull and uninspired fellow, an ignorant man of no account. Now that was during the campaign. So you could regard that as prejudicial, but in any way- Well, event, he endorsed Landon. <laughs> That's who, what his supporters were saying. Uh, all these decades later, you do puzzle about whether they uh, did any research whatsoever into how Landon got elected because he was never a good campaigner. This wasn't discontinuous. This was his style. He was just gonna fall into the presidency. Now we move over to the Democratic campaign and Roosevelt's campaign. Important here is that he goes on a train to take the Western swing, and eventually they'll swing through New England. Eleanor Roosevelt is on the train. Is she an important element of his campaign at this time? Do they regard her as a tool they can use to their advantage? When it starts, even though she's been in the news uh, more so than any other first lady, visiting those coal mines and at such and such and such. Both the Democrats and the Republicans don't think this is a, a winning strategy for the, for the Democratic campaign. The Republicans hide Alf Landon's wife, who might've been the best part of the campaign. She's very young, very attractive, photogenic. Um, and the Democrats wanna hide Eleanor too when Roosevelt goes off on that campaign trail. They don't want her on the platform. They, they think that maybe she's too much for 1936 America, and they're wrong. They're wrong. When she steps out on that platform, she, she's the star as much as Franklin Roosevelt. And when the Democrats go off uh, on that train trip through Southern New England at the end of the campaign, the crowds are just, just immense like 150,000 people in Rhode Island and, 
and and just uh, the crowds are so frenzied in their enthusiasm that Eleanor is afraid that people might actually get hurt or killed. It's important now to connect Eleanor to a part of the campaign that turns out to be most important, which is the African-American vote. There isn't much for campaigning in the South because of the brutality of the segregationists, the racists. However, in the North, the vote is extremely important in large cities. And Eleanor is the bridge. Uh, David has very careful reporting about how Eleanor handled this. They, Franklin and, and Eleanor Roosevelt were people of their time. Their language sometimes was unacceptable to us in the 21st century. But the two details that were important to African-Americans who were harder hit than any demography in a demographic group in the, in the U.S. by the by the severe downturn, the collapse of confidence in the economy. Uh, and they accounted for the relief plans. Generally, it was called reliefers. They accounted for the relief plans, getting a paycheck, whether it was uh, the, uh, the, conserv the CCC uh, working outside or any of the opportunities to, to get work for the government. That was important to the African-American vote in the North. But Eleanor, campaign for the anti-lynching law. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt didn't support it, David. D did he use Eleanor? Did Eleanor ignore him? Because she was for it. Did that in any way cause controversy in the Democratic Party? Well, that uh, Eleanor-Franklin relationship was always, shall we say, complex. And Franklin is, Franklin supplies the cash. He supplies the jobs, he supplies the programs, but he doesn't supply the love. He doesn't supply the respect that Eleanor Roosevelt is so famously supplies and will supply for, for the black community. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're doing things differently. Eleanor wants to push the anti-lynching law. The NAACP wants to push it. Franklin says, nope, I can't do it. I can't get it through the Congress. I can't get it through the Senate. I can't get it past the uh, Southern Democrats. I wish I were given a different hand to play in creating this new deal, but I will not jeopardize my program. I will not sacrifice the safety of the nation for this. Uh, whether he thinks this is the case or not, or whether he's just not that interested uh, it remains to be seen. One uh, very high-ranking uh, Black official says, look, he just didn't care about us. He was a patrician, and he was just cold as ice towards us. So it's, it's very, it's, it's, they're covering the bases, but they are covering the bases separately in winning the Black vote. And the Black vote is key in the North. And in New York City and in Chicago and in the large cities that Roosevelt is worried about. And we come now to, I think, the high point of the campaign. David presents it very carefully, the swing through New York. The state that Roosevelt comes from can be in doubt because of all these factions. He travels to the Brooklyn Academy of Music and makes a speech on the 30th. And then Eleanor's in town campaigning ferociously up and down town shaking hands, meeting people on the street. However, Roosevelt, the president, makes a presentation at the Madison Square Garden, Halloween night, October 31st, is my note from David. And he makes a speech that, that peels paint, David. This would peel paint today as well. What is he thinking at this straight up class warfare speech? Well, he, he started with the class warfare in his December 1935 State of the uh, Union address follows that up at the Philadelphia Convention. We remember that for Rendezvous with Destiny. His favorite phrase there is the economic royalists. We means the rich guys, the business interests, Wall Street, et cetera. And then he says at Madison Square Garden, uh, again, how these wealthy individuals, business and in influential uh, in interests are, uh, could be oppressive could create a, a dictatorship over the economic interests of the, of the working people. And so he says, I welcome their hatred. And he says it, as, as, some observe, as, as one syndicated columnist says, 
you really had to hear his words. On paper, it was one thing, but hearing the intonation, it was just frenzied and irate. And he says, and I would hope that in my second administration, they would meet their master. And people in his administration uh, are at the fringes of it, like Ray Moley, the uh, rather estranged uh, brain truster at that point, or the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, or his pollster, Emil Herja, are all like coming out of that event saying, whoa, he's gone too far. But in fact, maybe he hasn't. Yes, Moley's horrified. All the speechwriters, or the pollster, Emil Herja, her, her, is is uh, is appalled. He, they recount. They think we might now be in trouble. Uh, Moli says thoughtful citizens were stunned by the violence, the bombast, the naked demagoguery of these sentences. David, they read wonderfully. They're really well. <laughs> no one who has has merely read them can half know the meaning conveyed by the cadences of the voice that uttered them. So Moli's saying it wasn't just the language; it was the way FDR delivered it, and. We now turn to why it is there were all these doubts about his re-election. What we're about to see is a swamping of the Electoral College and a swamping of the popular vote. What preyed on them, David? Was it just that they were wise not to be caught overconfident? Were, were they taking their key from the president? Because certainly by this time, he had some sense that, the, that Landon was a poor campaigner and that the people were with him. So. Where was the major anxiety in the campaign? One, one of the reasons why Landon was being boosted at first is it, there was a sense that the public was no longer so concerned about relief and the depression, but wanted greater economy in government. And that they were concerned about the deficits, concerned about too much spending. And this was continuing all through 35 and 36. At the beginning of 36, uh, Gallup has a poll, or no, liter, liter, lit, the Literary Digest has a poll, and 62% of the people say they're no longer crazy about the New Deal, which is a complete flip from when it had been like during the midterms or a year earlier when 62% were in favor of it. So there was a, a sliding of public opinion but also, you know, the Great Depression was still going on. Um, at the November 1936, the unemployment rate is still with tens of millions of people on the federal payroll or getting relief and with a big deficit, 13.9%. This is not what I would call a robust recovery. Roosevelt and Sweep Nation. FDR's 1936 landslide and the triumph of the liberal ideal. David Petrusha is the author. David Petrusha's book is great fun because at the time it was tragedy upon tragedy. People were struggling to have confidence each day that there would be a tomorrow. The world at uh, the United States at this time was watching Europe tumble into the catastrophe we know as the Second War. Still with us, still scarring mankind. But at this moment, we come to election night and David celebrates election night by taking us to a scene in the Hyde Park scene, the one where Roosevelt always returned to Hyde Park. It was like he recharged his batteries there. Eleanor is in a white chiffon gown with an immense red rose. I'm following in her belt. I'm following David's reporting. The reporters are gathered outside. The teletype machines are chattering away. David, they still expected to, for it to be close that late in the night. Is that correct? Well, they didn't. They didn't know. And uh, politics is a time of surprises. Um, Jim Farley was always very confident. He had predicted that Roosevelt would take uh, 46 out of 48 states. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was predicting a win and had been the, the whole time, but not a massive, massive landslide. Um, the Literary Digest was still, which, which had a sample, it was a straw poll, it wasn't scientific, people mailed their responses in, but they had millions of responses. They had missed the 1932 election by only two electoral votes. They had everything right except one state in 1924. 
1916, which was an eyelash, they had got that right. So they had always been right. So why would you think they wouldn't be right? Or why would they be so horribly wrong in 1936? The first notes that come in are from New Haven, Connecticut, right across the border from Dutchess County. And Roosevelt himself reacts when he learns that he's won New Haven by 15,000 votes. That tells him something strange is happening. And the teletype starts to chatter. David, the, the celebration goes on to a point where I have to believe they were, they were drunk with not quite believing it. Because well, he didn't believe it. He says, that can't be right. You're reading that wrong. And then they read it to him, they verify it. And it's like, holy cow, this is going to be good. This could be the realignment of American politics that I was hoping for. This is beyond a mandate. Um, so the, the party really starts get to get going then. In Kansas, meanwhile, where I don't think they had big hopes at that point, their internal polling was actually pretty bad. They, were, they had a poll from the Nielsen organization, the people who do the TV and radio ratings. And at one point we have, we have this data that, that he was behind 50 to 33. So they, they kind of knew they were in trouble. But um, it, it, with Roosevelt in high, well, in Landon, they had a big uh, birthday or celebratory cake prepared. And uh, Landon said, you better cut that quick to his wife because it may be too late uh, with the returns coming in. And he has coattails like, like, like a, a royal train. Afterwards, yeah. the final vote, 74 members of the Senate are Democratic, 334 members of the House are Democratic, 38 governorships. He, he sweeps everything in. And David, I congratulate you for identifying the moment when the modern Democratic Party puts together what we know now to be its strength in the big cities. And they've never really looked back from this moment. Um. 106, for some reason, the, the figure came out of 106 big league major cities in the United States. And Roosevelt carries 104 of those, except for Pasadena and Syracuse. Rose, even Hoover had carried 15 of them 14 years before that. And the, there was a study done in 1907 regarding the immigrant population, particularly in, in the cities, but all over the country and that their children were going to come of age somewhere between 1930 and 1940. Well, somewhere happened to be 1936, and all those folks really flopped down for Franklin Roosevelt. And you see the results in, in, in certain demographic groups. The black vote, which had been Republican forever, and even for Hoover in 1932, is going to be 71% for Roosevelt in 1936. The Catholic vote, 75%. The Jewish vote, 90%. The, the far West is, is somewhere between 60 and 70% for, for Roosevelt. So it's, it's a landslide in, and in the, I think the, probably the most startling place is in Pennsylvania, which had been so solidly Republican. Hey not only Pennsylvania, Philadelphia goes for Hoover in 1932, flips to uh, Roosevelt and uh, the city or the city of Pittsburgh, which, which in 1929, I think had a, re, a democratic registration of 3%, 3% uh, is carried by Roosevelt in, in 1936. It's, it's just a complete landslide. You take a look at those congressional and senatorial numbers for the Republicans, and the Whigs are in better shape just before they go out of business. Roosevelt Sweeps Nation, David Petrush is the author. I'm John Batchelor.